J. Elias, General Legal Counsel at Dyer Lake Funeral Home in North Attleboro. Welcome to this episode of Live and Learn, a series of programs designed to be informative, educational, and upbeat, and always intended to enhance and encourage our personal wellness and awareness. This program is about some of the things that you may not have known about a few well-known and maybe well-loved holidays and holiday traditions. For many of us, we may never have known the real meaning behind a few of our well-beloved holidays. They've simply become a day off from school or work, or they mark the beginning or the end of a season. So let's start with what has been a long journey for the character we've come to know as Santa Claus, that jolly, rosy-cheeked, white-bearded, portly, gift-giving fellow. To many, Santa Claus is also known as Saint Nick or Saint Nicholas, Father Christmas, think Charles Dickens' classic, A Christmas Carol. It's the life story of Saint Nicholas of Myra that's as fascinating as the folklore that's made Saint Nick or Santa Claus, in whatever guise he might be, a holiday fixture for centuries. So Saint Nicholas of Myra has been known as the patron saint of sailors, merchants, repentant thieves, and children, to name a few. But how is it that so many have come to associate St. Nicholas of Myra with Christmas and gift-giving? Well, here's the back story. Legend has it that St. Nicholas was born in the third century in Myra, Greece, as Nicholas. Brought up in a wealthy and devout Christian family, his parents died in an epidemic and left young Nicholas an orphan with a large inheritance which he's said to have given away entirely to the poor and needy. Nicholas was later ordained a priest and ultimately became the Bishop of Myra, greatly admired for his generosity, his love of children, and his concern for the safety of sailors, since Myra was a port town and many of the villagers made their living from the sea. While there are countless tales about St. Nicholas's selflessness and devotion to the protection of children, the most well-known is the story of an impoverished father who had no money to offer as a dowry for his daughters to get married. See, in those days, a woman had to offer a dowry to her groom to be considered for marriage. And when dowry money wasn't available, the young woman would be considered unmarriageable, would often be sold into slavery or prostitution. In this story, it said the father had not one but three daughters and no money for any of their dowries. Horrified at the thought of having his daughters sold into slavery, the man prayed for help. Bishop Nicholas is said to have learned of the man's plight, and so on three separate occasions he secretly threw a bag of gold down the father's chimney, each of which landed in the stockings or shoes of the family members who had placed them near the fireplace to warm, enabling the man to offer the dowry his daughters needed to marry. It's said that from that point on, local children began placing their shoes and stockings near the fireplaces in the hopes that Nicholas would leave them a gift. And while we're on the subject of Christmas, it's often said that the first reference to reindeer pulling Santa's sleigh was in an 1821 illustrated children's poem called Old Santa Claus with Much Delight. Two years later, in 1823, a poem many of us know by Clement Moore titled a visit from St. Nicholas, more popularly known as Twas the Night Before Christmas. It's often credited for the contemporary Christmas lore that includes eight named reindeer. When what to my wondering eyes should appear but a miniature sleigh and eight tiny reindeer, with a little old driver so lively and quick I knew in a moment it must be St. Nick. More rapid than eagles with coursers they came and he whistled and shouted and called them by name. Now Dasher, now Dancer, now Prancer and Vixen, on Comet, on Cupid, on Donner and Blitzen. That's eight. But what about Rudolph, the red-nosed reindeer, the ninth reindeer? Here's the backstory. The year was 1939 and the Great Depression was still affecting the lives of millions of people. Chicago-based Montgomery Ward, a department store chain second only in size to Sears, as America's largest retailer, had up until then purchased and given away free coloring books to children every year at Christmas time. But in 1939, the store decided to create their own book, both to save costs and to spread a bit of cheer. 
They assigned the task of writing the book to Robert L. May, an advertising copywriter at Montgomery Ward, with simple instructions. The story was to be about Christmas and about an animal. May was known among his colleagues as having a terrific way with words, limericks, and parodies. So he set about to write a story of an underdog, red-nosed reindeer, who happened to be in the right place at the right time when Santa needed a reindeer with exceptional skills. He said he created the special little reindeer with a shiny nose after remembering his daughter's love for the deer at Chicago's Lincoln Park Zoo. And he also said he thought the little creature might become a symbol for himself and his daughter Barbara for happier times to lay ahead because only months into the project, May's young wife died of cancer, leaving him a single father of his young daughter. May's boss at Montgomery Ward offered to take the reindeer project off his plate, given his personal circumstances. But as May later said, he refused to do so because he needed Rudolph then more than ever. And when it came time for May to show a draft of the story to his boss, well, it seems his boss was underwhelmed and purportedly said, can't you come up with anything better? But Robert May believed in his story and he enlisted a colleague of his in Montgomery Ward's art department, asking him to draw some sketches. In the end, as we know, they were able to convince May's boss to move forward with Rudolph's story. And the book, it was an immediate hit. Montgomery Ward printed and distributed more than two million copies that year at branches across the country. And although it may have been a success for the store, May's personal life wasn't nearly as successful. The truth is he was living on a copywriter's meager salary and was heavily burdened by medical debt from his wife's illness. And then it seems fate intervened. After the end of World War II, for reasons which forever were unknown to May and quite unheard of, Montgomery Ward's CEO turned over full ownership rights of Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer to Robert May. And the stars aligned again for Robert May later that same year, when his sister married a somewhat struggling songwriter by the name of Johnny Marks. Marks always kept a notebook with him where he jot his thoughts and ideas for songs. And he did the same after reading Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. And so one year into his marriage into the May family, he began adding music to the Rudolph storyline. Quietly confident that he might have a hit on his hands, he asked Gene Autry, already a famous singing cowboy and movie star, to record the song. Although Autry didn't care much for the song, his wife did, and she persuaded Autry to put it out as a B-side on his next record. As it turns out, that B-side with Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer became the second best-selling Christmas song of all time, behind only White Christmas. Now, let's turn the calendar back a month to November and the Thanksgiving Day holiday. As with so many other holidays we celebrate, this one may not have come to be in the way you thought. I think it's fair to say that most of us are familiar with the story of the Pilgrim's first Thanksgiving feast, held the year after they arrived in Plymouth in 1620. But I suspect few of us were familiar with the pivotal role that a woman by the name of Sarah Josepha Hale, played in making Thanksgiving Day a national holiday. And here's the backstory. Born in New Hampshire in 1788, more than 150 years after the Pilgrims arrived, Hale was an educator and an author who founded a private school when she was just 18 years old. In addition to teaching, she wrote short stories, poems, and articles on a wide range of topics and many were published in local newspapers. She also wrote and published a novel, which as it so happens was read by the publisher of a magazine called Ladies Magazine. And that fellow in turn offered Sarah Hale a job with his magazine and she became the first woman editor of a magazine in the United States. What's that got to do with Thanksgiving? Well, throughout her time as an editor, Hale also wrote hundreds of letters to governors, ministers, newspaper editors, and every United States president during her lifetime with one request, that the last Thursday in November be set aside to, quote, offer to God our tribute of joy and gratitude for the blessings of the year, 
And in 1863, with the country torn by the Civil War, Sarah Hale's letter-writing campaign seems to have struck a chord. That year, she put her Thanksgiving message into the form of an editorial and sent it to President Abraham Lincoln, urging him to make Thanksgiving Day a fixed national festival. And Lincoln embraced the idea. On October 3rd, 1863, he issued a proclamation declaring the last Thursday of November to be National Thanksgiving Day and ordered all government offices in Washington closed on that day. Well, years later, in 1939, in the midst of the ongoing Great Depression again, President Franklin Roosevelt was urged and encouraged by retail store owners around the country to change Thanksgiving Day from the last Thursday in November to the third Thursday in the month. The reason? It would allow for more shopping days between Thanksgiving and Christmas, which in turn meant more revenue for store owners in the national economy. And although FDR did so, it seemed that millions of Americans continued to celebrate Thanksgiving Day on the last Thursday of November, as they had for many years. It seems that the change proved to be highly controversial, and Roosevelt was called a tradition defier in the press. Some states chose to celebrate Thanksgiving on the last Thursday of the month anyway, and the result was that family and friends who lived in different states didn't have the same days off from work or were unable to celebrate together. So ultimately, in 1941, FDR proclaimed the Thanksgiving holiday to be recognized on the fourth Thursday in November as a day to be observed in giving thanks to the heavenly source of our earthly blessings. No mention of the pilgrims. And Congress thereafter enacted a law to that effect. Oh, by the way, you may know Sarah Josepha Hale for one of the more famous poems she wrote and published in 1830. And that would be, Mary Had a Little Lamb. Okay, one more quick Thanksgiving backstory. The year, 1953. The company, C.A. Swanson and Sons. It was a Nebraska-based food company widely recognized for its frozen poultry and chicken pot pies. That year, it seems, they took the frozen dinner concept to the national level as the result of a catastrophically unsuccessful Thanksgiving holiday for the sale of frozen turkeys. After unexpectedly low Thanksgiving bird sales that year, Swanson found itself with some 520,000 pounds of leftover frozen turkey. To keep them from thawing and going bad, the company placed the frozen birds in several refrigerated railroad cars. At the time, that was the early 1950s, the refrigeration systems in railway cars worked only when the vehicles were actually moving. So the company decided to shuttle the trains with the frozen turkeys back and forth between its Nebraska headquarters and the East Coast while its executives frantically tried to find a solution to their problem of what to do with about 260 tons of frozen turkey. There are several versions of what happened next. In one, Jerry Thomas, a Swanson salesman, is said to have remembered seeing aluminum trays meant for frozen food while visiting a distributor's warehouse in Pittsburgh. Inspired by the tray, he's said to have sketched the idea of a three-compartment version that could double as both a cooking and serving tray, with the trays filled with the leftover turkey and gravy, dressing, peas, and sweet potatoes. Swanson promptly embarked on a massive nationwide marketing campaign. 1953, so they were tying the dinners in their aluminum trays to the newest must-have prestige appliance at the moment, the television. And if you look at the box containing those early Swanson frozen dinners, you'll discover that the company cleverly designed its packaging to look like little TVs, tuning knobs and all. And for the record, the popular new meals were priced at 98 cents and bolstered with the guarantee of dinner in 25 minutes. Let's move ahead to February 14th and the holiday we know of as Valentine's Day. Although the origin of Valentine's Day are far from clear, one thing seems to be fairly certain. The origins of this holiday aren't quite as romantic as the messages we read in all those Hallmark cards. And here's the back story. An often cited legend has it that Valentine was a Catholic priest, 
serving during the third century in Rome. It's been said that Roman Emperor Claudius II decreed single men made better soldiers than those with wives and families. They'd be less apt to be distracted and more likely to focus their thoughts and energies on defending the empire and Claudius. So Claudius outlawed marriage for young men. Believing the emperor's decree was unjust, Valentine defied Claudius and continued to perform marriage ceremonies in secret for young Roman lovers. Not such a good idea. For when it was discovered what Valentine was doing, he was beheaded. And his martyrdom remembered on what has come to be known as Valentine's Day. Another holiday that's come to be synonymous with candy is Halloween. It seems the celebration of Halloween originated from an ancient Celtic festival known as Samhain, first celebrated about 2,000 years ago on November 1. The day was believed to be a time when the spirits of the dead would rise again and walk among the living. The festival involved lighting bonfires, offering sacrifices, and pretty much paying homage to the dead. Costumes and masks were worn to ward off fairies and spirits and to confuse them. The day also marked the end of summer, the end of the harvest period, and the beginning of the dark, cold winter, a time of year then that was often associated with death. It's also been said that the traditional Halloween color, colors we've come to know, black and orange, found their origins in the same festival. For the Celts, black represented the death of summer, while the orange symbolized the autumn harvest season. And in later years, the Catholic Church designated November 2 as All Souls Day, a time for honoring the souls of the deceased. Celebrations throughout England resembled the Celtic commemorations of Samhain, complete with bonfires and masquerades, and the poor were known to visit the houses of wealthier families and receive pastries called soul cakes in exchange for a promise to pray for the souls of the homeowner's deceased relatives. The custom became known as souling and was later taken up by children who'd go from door to door asking for gifts such as food, money, and even ale think trick-or-treat. And on the topic of Halloween, I'd be remiss not to make a quick digression for those who have a special place in their heart for Charlie Brown and the Peanuts gang, and that's the Great Pumpkin. In the 1966 Halloween television special, it's a great pumpkin, Charlie Brown. While all of the other kids are gleefully going door-to-door trick-or-treating, well-intended but misinformed Linus Van Pelt patiently waits all night for the Great Pumpkin to appear. And as he tells the rest of the Peanuts gang, blurring the distinction between Christmas and Halloween, every year on October 31st, the great pumpkin rises out of the pumpkin patch and flies through the air and brings toys to all the children in the world. From the great pumpkin to the backstory of the Easter bunny, do you ever wonder how it is that on Easter, one of the central holidays of Christianity, commemorating the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the Easter Bunny often makes its appearance. And as most of us know, the Bible makes no mention of a mythical bunny delivering colorful eggs and candy to children. So why is it that a rabbit has become a prominent part of one of Christianity's most important celebrations of rebirth and renewal? Well, here's a bit of a backstory. One theory has it that the symbol of the bunny rabbit stems from an ancient pagan tradition and festival, Estra or Ustra, honoring the goddess of fertility and spring. The animal symbol for the goddess was the rabbit, which has long stood for fertility, let's just say due to the animal's energetic breeding. Eggs were buried and eaten during the festival, believed to be a symbol both of fertility and of the rebirth of nature after the dead of winter. It's also thought that eggs are associated with Easter because of the traditional fasting during Lent when animal products could not be eaten. Eggs may have been hard-boiled and stored and then eaten at the end of Lent. And it's often reported that the Easter bunny was first introduced in this country in the 1700s by German immigrants to Pennsylvania. One more backstory. Not long after Easter is Mother's Day. For many Americans, it's a day to honor our mothers. Think flowers, cards, a visit, or at least a phone call. And then, of course, there's that wonder of wonders, breakfast in bed. 
Although Hallmark began creating and producing Mother's Day cards in the early 1920s, the backstory very different than what you might have thought. The truth is that Mother's Day began as something very much unlike those celebrated Hallmark moments. It said the idea of a Mother's Day began in 1852 when Anna Marie Jarvis's mother, Anne Reeves Jarvis, organized a series of Mother's Day work clubs in the Appalachian community surrounding her home in West Virginia. That's mothers, plural, not just one's mother. Her intention was to improve poor health and sanitary conditions, which had contributed to a high mortality rate of children in the area. Those work clubs provided medicine for the poor. They hired women to work for families when mothers were ill and unable to work, and they inspected bottled milk and food for safety. And Ann Jarvis, she was also a committed peace activist who organized those Mother's Day work clubs to care for soldiers on both sides of the Civil War. They provide relief to Northern and Confederate soldiers throughout the region in an effort to create an element of peace in communities torn apart by political differences. She died on May 9, 1905, and her daughter Anna held a memorial service for her on the first anniversary of her death, praising the outstanding accomplishments her mother made through those Mother's Day work clubs. Anna, the daughter, then embarked on a lifelong campaign employing every means available to her in order to establish Mother's Day as a national holiday, writing hundreds of letters to legislators, executives, businessmen, and she seized every opportunity to promote her project, raising awareness for the outstanding accomplishments of women like her mother and those who were a part of the Mother's Day work clubs. And on May 10, 1908, the first Mother's Day ceremonies were held at an Episcopal church in West Virginia, and the adoption of Mother's Day spread far more rapidly than Jarvis expected. By 1909, 45 states, as well as Puerto Rico, Hawaii, Canada, and Mexico, observed the day. And by 1914, President Woodrow Wilson signed a resolution proclaiming Mother's Day a national holiday to be celebrated on the second Sunday in May. But the problem is that it soon became clear to Jarvis that the celebration of Mother's Day, as she had envisioned it, had instead transformed into that time of commercialization through the purchase of cards and flowers and candies. She was appalled by the fact that the meaning of the day had been lost, and she began openly campaigning against Mother's Day profiteers. She often spoke out against candy makers and florists, among others, and she filed countless lawsuits against groups who even used the name Mother's Day. Jarvis even lobbied the federal government to remove the holiday from American calendars. Her goal had been to commemorate women like her mother for what she called the, quote, matchless service they rendered to humanity in every field of life. And in the end, she and her sister spent their entire family inheritance funding an uphill battle against what they saw as a Mother's Day holiday that became all about commercialization, and sadly, they both died in poverty. For many, the end of summer and the beginning of the school year coincides with the Labor Day holiday, a federal holiday observed on the first Monday in September. It means Labor Day sales everywhere, family barbecues, get-togethers, and that last hurrah before the start of fall. Labor Day has been celebrated as a national holiday since 1894, and was intended to honor our country's labor movement, recognizing the many contributions workers have made to the strength, prosperity, and well-being of America. It has, in fact, its origins during one of our country's darkest chapters for the American labor movement. In the late 1800s, at the height of the Industrial Revolution in the United States, the average American worked 12-hour days, seven days a week, just to scrape out a basic living. And children as young as five or six often worked in mill factories, coal mines across the countries. In fact, child labor was so commonplace that in the late 1800s, just about 20% of all American workers were actually under the age of 16. And that was due in part to the fact that kids were able to fit in tight spaces and operate small machinery. And employers could save money by paying them lower wages than any adult. 
Children, many below the age of seven, often worked 12-hour shifts for only a dollar or less a day, and they were often injured while working, missing fingers or limbs, developing tuberculosis and other respiratory diseases, being killed on the job. But as manufacturing increasingly replaced agriculture as the core of employment in the country, labor unions grew more prominent and vocal, and they began organizing strikes and rallies to protest poor conditions and to compel employers to renegotiate hours and pay. Some of them turned violent. And so the idea of a working man's holiday caught on across the country, with some states passing legislation to recognize it. It wasn't until 1894, though, when employees of the Pullman Palace Car Company in Chicago went on strike to protest wage cuts and the firing of union reps that a National Labor Day began to take shape. And that same year, President Grover Cleveland signed a law making the first Monday in September our National Labor Day holiday. One quick last backstory. According to the New York Times Square District Management Association, it was in 1907 that the first New Year's Eve ball made its descent from a flagpole atop one Times Square. Since then, seven versions of the ball have ushered in the new year. The first New Year's Eve celebration in Times Square took place in New Year's Eve 1904, when the owners of the New York Times newspaper wanted to celebrate the opening of the newspaper's new headquarters located at one Times Square, and they set fireworks off from the roof of the building. And although hundreds of thousands of people attended the event, the owners of the New York Times wanted an even bigger spectacle to draw more attention to the area. Unfortunately, the city soon banned the fireworks display from tops of buildings in downtown New York, and that put an end to the rooftop display. But thanks to the work of a Ukrainian immigrant and a metal worker named Jacob Starr, the first New Year's Eve ball made its debu debut. It was crafted of iron and wood and adorned with 125 watt light bulbs, measured five feet in diameter, weighed about 700 pounds. And until its replacement, that ball was lowered every year beginning in 1907, except for 1942 and 1943, when ceremonies were suspended due to a wartime dim out of lights in New York City. By the way, the current version of the ball was introduced in 2007 in celebration of the 100th anniversary of the Times Square ball drop tradition. Unlike that first ball, which weighed about 700 pounds, the current one weighs close to 12,000 pounds and measures 12 feet in diameter. And it's made up of about 2,700 Waterford crystals illuminated by 32,000 LED lights. They can create a palette of more than 16 million colors and billions of patterns. And that ball stays atop one Times Square all year round. It only drops once on New Year's Eve. I'm Jay Elias. Thank you for joining me for another episode of Live and Learn. I hope you enjoyed it, and I look forward to you joining me again for another program designed to enhance and encourage your personal wellness and awareness. Until then, remember, it's never too late to learn. And in closing, consider what Donald Rumsfeld, the former U.S. Secretary of Defense, once said, and I'll say it slowly, there are known knowns. These are things we know that we know. There are known unknowns. That is to say, there are things that we know we don't know. But there are also unknown unknowns. There are things we don't know we don't know.